Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rainer Kattel. I'm Deputy Director and Professor at IIPP, or Institute for Innovation and, and Public Purpose at UCL. And we are the co-host of this lecture series on rethinking public value and public purpose in the 21st century capitalism with British Library. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker and topic, and also later be the sort of the guide to the question and answers. First of all, the idea of the lecture series is about public value. So if you if you look at a typical economist or a even a public policy person, what they usually talk about are public goods, like clean air, for instance. And yeah, it sort of makes sense. Nobody can appropriate clean air and try to sell it, even if you were, I don't know, Donald Trump. And it's so, sort of difficult to do. And the rest of it is like private goods, and you could sort of try to sell it and make an economy out of it. And I think this is what we are trying to go up against, is the idea that everything has to be so individual, privatized, small scale, about me and not about us, and not about the public value or the publicness of the space around us, of the economy around us, and even the politics around us. So we are really trying to bring back the idea of public in terms of what we value, how do we live, and what we do collectively together in politics, in policy, and how do we build our environment around us, cities. And this is where our uh, today's speaker, Dan Hill, uh, will be focusing on is, is a cities and an, as an environment around us. So first of all, Dan is a visiting professor with us at IIPP, of course. Um, but he's also at AHARP, is a design and digital firm here in London. And Tan has a very extensive experience working in very different kinds of organizations, shall we say, from BBC, which is a very large public organization, to a CITRA, which is also a public but very small organization in Finland, but at the same time a uh, very strategic um, organization. So he has worked in various public-private partnership settings and tried to design journeys from, for public organizations, for citizens, and also for private organizations. So I think this makes Tan a unique thinker for our series as well. And um, I think Tan calls himself an urbanist designer thinker, all of this together. And, for um, want of a better word. <laughs> yes. If anybody has a suggestion, a, a nice one. Exactly. So, so he I mean, sort of moves between various professions, which I think at this day and age is really interesting to find people who, who are not disciplinary, who are not in one silo, but are um, brave enough uh, to, to stray from, from their own sort of home base into various fields. And so without further ado, I would like to just mention one thing. Dan is a really great and pro prolific writer. So if you haven't seen his blog on medium.com, please check it out. There's great blogs from around various topics. And so if you don't get enough of Dan today, you can go home and read about him and from him later. So floor is yours for an hour, and then I'll come back and then we have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for inviting me. And thanks for everybody for coming out on a, in the evening after work. Um, if you've been working. <laughs> I've been working, sort of. Um, so, yeah, thanks for that, Rainer, and thanks for the plug for the writing as well. The writing is slightly more considered than the speaking, as you'll see, but um, the same kind of stuff. So I'm going to talk for a bit. I'm going to show a lot of things, so forgive me in advance for bombarding you slightly. I hope that um, it's kind of a shotgun-like approach and that within that you'll all find something that you'll find interesting. Um, so I work at Arup, as Reiner said, it's a large design, engineering, architecture consultancy, I suppose, um, based all over the world in about 38 different countries, um, based out of the UK. And then we work at UCL. I'm also at RMIT University in Melbourne, and I'm one of the Mayor of London's design advocates, and that's enough about me. Um, in terms of Arup, the interesting, one of the interesting things that attracts me to Arup anyway is this idea of total design. And that is a funny way of sort of dealing with the, I like to think of myself as disciplined but not disciplinary <laughs> in that sense perhaps, but uh, 
total design was over, Arup's original conception of the firm, I suppose, has begun to mature. I mean, he wrote it down in the early 70s, at least. This idea of taking a very holistic, multidisciplinary view at a, at a, at a problem or an opportunity. Not assuming that your discipline is the, the one and only answer to it, but that it takes multiple disciplines to bring together as something as complex as a building or even more complex as a city. So the team that I run there is very much in that spirit. And the work I hope you'll see is also within that spirit. Um, and what we're going to talk a lot, a lot in the next hour or so is, is this question of actually the city as it is now and then technology in particular as a sort of a motive force within that. And I just want to be clear about the word technology as well. And I'm taking a very broad view of what that word means, as in it could be almost any tool that humans have made <laughs> in order to achieve something. So a pencil in that sense is technology. A lawnmower is technology, but clearly also Uber is technology as well. So have that conception in mind. I'm not just talking about the digital things when we talk that. And sometimes it's become a bit easy to say tech and just mean a few things there which isn't very helpful because cities have been shaped by technology for a very long time, whether it's building technologies like drop ceilings or elevators or flush toilets, all of those enable different types of building uh, or canals or railways, obviously they enable different types of city or settlement. So see it in that context, please. And then the second thing is this quote I use from Cedric Price, which is then uh, be critical of technology as well and, and really try to address what the underlying question is in the first place before we jump on a particular thing that looks like a solution. I suspect as, as a species we're quite motivated to jump on solutions, we seem to be like that. Um, and certainly in the world of cities and built environment people often assume that they know the answer and then get you to deliver the answer. Um, what we're trying to say is let's at least have a conversation about what the question might be first. And he said this in 1965, it's still quite relevant I think half a century later. Um, and uh, then, of course, the cities were being quite radically shaped around things like the car and the, the technology of the, mo the motor car in that sense. And had we stopped and thought, well, hang on, what kind of city do we want in the first place and how do we want people to move around, then we might have had a slightly more profound conversation about what the answer might be. And it might not have just been the car. And many cities were rebuilt rapidly within about two to three years around the car. If you think about Los Angeles, the largest tram network in the world was in Los Angeles. It was taken out within about three or four years. Um, that, that three or four years decision then has a, a huge half-life, <laughs> as in 100 years almost later. They will still be trying to build light rail schemes in Los Angeles to get even 10% of what they once had. The second largest was in Sydney, and that was also taken out within about two to three years, in about 1958. So, have to be very careful with these technologies because they can look like an answer and then if you do them wrong uh, because of the way that cities work and the slowness of those changes and the, the inability to, to use a tech word, pivot, um, it's deeply problematic. So hence that. The second thing is this understanding of digital technology. And I like, I like this phrase of the writer John Lanchester who uh, borrowed it from someone else, I think, but encapsulated it nicely as the kind of technology I am talking about, to be honest, isn't so much the pencil. Um, that one's perfectly good. <laughs> um, we sort of know what we're doing with it. It's the tech that is on the edge of our understanding or is here and now, but we don't quite fully understand what it might or might not do. And these things exist in the world and we use them, but we don't really understand the implication of them. And I suspect probably that's what the motor car felt like too urban planners in the 1950s and 60s seems promising. Who can possibly foresee that? But as, as someone much cleverer than I said, if you invent the motor car, you also invent the traffic jam at the same time. It's difficult to focus on the traffic jam because everybody's like, hey, motor car. So we need to understand this stuff and understand that also that it's not going to work to begin with. He's talking here about this Amazon Alexa. Who has one of these out of interest? Just hands up. Anybody in the room has one? Maybe one or two. So. These are these things that sit in your kitchen. You can talk to them. They're like Siri, if you have that on an iPhone or the Android equivalent, and they can talk back. You can say, play Radio 4 or order some milk and things like that. It might play Radio 4. It might order some milk. <laughs> um, and equally, it might not. Um, they're incredibly sophisticated, I and mean, it's almost a magical object. Imagine talking to a kettle and having a conversation with it. You know, that's been the subject of fantasy for a very long time, but that's here and now, and it sort of works. But it maybe works 99%, actually, but actually that final 1% turns out to be really difficult. 
And really the difference between it being genuinely properly useful and something you could rely upon and something that's kind of a nice to have maybe if that. Um, so he always makes the point that you know when, you, when it came out originally, you could say play Radio 1, it would play Radio 1, and you could say set the volume to 10, and it would turn the volume right up on Radio 1. And then it was so loud, it couldn't actually hear you say, now set the volume to five. <laughs> so you had to literally unplug it. Uh, so incredibly sophisticated and unbelievably dumb at the same time. So this is sort of the thing that we're looking at here. I'd argue actually Uber is the same. It's you know, incredibly sophisticated and incredibly dumb simultaneously in terms of what it does. So we just have to be very aware of this and careful with it. So that's the work we're doing. Nonetheless, uh, we can't ignore it. It's, it's too difficult to say, well, let's just put all that back in the box and go back to um, the way things used to be, because that never used to be like that anyway, as we all know. But uh, it's unbelievably valuable, all of this stuff. It's unbelievably, I mean, in, in both cases, I'd argue, of the word value, the both public and private value. Clearly, in terms of private value, market capitalization of these huge firms, Apple, Amazon, blah, blah, blah. They're the biggest in the world, I mean, by huge amounts. And if the list continued, there'd be many, 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 many more like that. These are the most valuable firms as of 2016. And if you look at about 2001, it's interesting, actually, the, the difference. These technology companies, which I would, as a designer, argue are very much about the user experience of things, the way you use things, and whether they're good or not. Apple released some iPhones last night, I believe. If they're no good, their stock price will fall through the floor straight away. They'll lose hundreds of millions. When Facebook messed up everybody's data about two months ago, as you remember, you may remember, um, it was the largest loss in stock market history of any stocks ever, you know, effectively overnight when the, when the ruling came back. So they are predicated directly on their relationship with you. If they mess up your data, they suffer. If they do an amazing thing, then they do well. And that's really different to say, I'd argue, GE or Exxon, which were very much sort of in the background of life. And if you think about a petrol company, it's not like you probably, I, would, I don't know, I wasn't driving, I don't drive, but anyway. I imagine people don't drive to a BP garage because the, the petrol is particularly lovely, you know, <laughs> compared to Exxon's oil, you know, it's sort of, it's probably the closest and the cheapest or something like that. So they're not predicated in terms of user experience or the way that they work for you or your identity and anything like this, whereas this stuff is deeply bound into things like cultural identity as well as functional requirements and things like that. So we are, they're also incredibly difficult to predict. Uh, and the world generally is incredibly complex, as we know. Any, anybody in the room that understands concepts like wicked problems will know that um, we are facing a set of conditions now in the 21st century, whether this is tech or politics, that cannot be easily resolved and solved in the way that 20th century problems arguably were. Um, Michael Spence, the Nobel Prize winning economist, just effectively says, we can't really know what's going to happen in 10 years. All we can do is make the transitions as seem seamless or painless and effective as possible. And that's a fundamentally different approach to cities, actually, because urban planning as a practice is more or less predicated on the idea that we can make long-term decisions. We have to make long-term decisions. When we build a railway station, it's a 200-year decision. When you take out a tram system like LA, it's a probably a 200-year decision. He's saying it's now tough to do 10 years, and I'd probably agree with him, to be honest. So it's a very different approach we require. This idea of VUCA, what the US military called VUCA, volatility, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. They realized that's what they were dealing with in a few of the more recent skirmishes as compared to the Cold War, which now seems like an incredibly clear thing. It wasn't at the time, but um, compared to a 21st century war, it's a really different beast. So there is good VUCA, as in there is good un unpredictability, as in the UK government's projections for solar cells, as in photovoltaic cells that citizens like you might put on their roof and generate energy from the sun. They thought by 2030, maybe you'll be about here in terms of megawatts installed and the low one is here. Actually, by 2015, this is what had happened. You know, as soon as they became viable, more or less, and within price range, people, of course, just bought them in tons of tons and tons of them. That's the government um, underestimating, as it tends to, I would argue, um, citizens' desire for things like this, in this case, sustainable energy. Why would you not have sustainable energy if you could choose it? Um, but that isn't something that a policymaker often sees. So there's good VUCA and um, there's bad VUCA, <laughs> as well, which I don't. 
really need to point out or dwell upon. Um, so it means that we can't do the thing that we used to do. This is Le Corbusier, the Swiss architect's hand hovering over a plan that he did for Paris, which never happened. <laughs> but the, they were in the time when they thought that kind of thing was within their gift. Now we don't do that. We cannot do that. We can't approach it in that way, I think, as a professional. Not to say the entire profession believes that, but certainly that didn't happen then. It's certainly not going to happen now. But we haven't really changed our practice much, so I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about it in the context of a different kind of urbanism then, one built almost from the ground up around these ideas of networks and connectivity, and to some extent technology, but a very sort of um, holistic approach to that, hopefully, about everyday life in a way. So what do we mean by that kind of thing? Well, you'll have heard, no doubt, of autonomous cars or self-driving cars and things like that, and you probably think they're some years off. and maybe maybe not but this is in Helsinki right now I say not right now it's not literally a live feed from Helsinki sadly I'm not that powerful but uh, that is on the Helsinki public transport system as a service you can get it's a self-driving bus that trundles backwards and forwards between the zoo and the city center um, it's kind of on demand you know which is interesting it's sort of you know it's live it's not a magical fantasy thing it's a real thing it's possible it's being tested for a couple of years, obviously, and they're trying small, but just to be clear, it's actually a real thing. Um, and these numbers here, a technical school in Zurich, MIT, and the US talk about how if you stacked that up and said, okay, shared buses like that, little shared mini buses, you could take 80% of the cars off the road and have a reasonable city work totally fine. Zurich, they did the model for Singapore, New York, they've done the model for more or less the same. So imagine London with 80% fewer vehicles, private cars. It's quite nice. <laughs> um, the number isn't 80% London, of course. It's not in London. And we don't know that if you did scale that up, it would be 80%. But we, equally, we don't know if it's 60%, maybe it's 40%. But even if it's 20%, that's a huge difference to something like the Archway Road or the Old Kent Road in terms of air quality in terms of what you can do with the street in terms of almost everything. So it's here and now and we need to start understanding this and the, the dynamic of it. Same thing with let's say water. So water falls, water falling underground in a city in San Francisco because of excessive rainfall, because of climate change basically. Uh, they need to upgrade the sewers because the sewers are useless because it's American infrastructure. Um, and they wanted to issue a $1.3 billion bond to pay for all of that stuff. And a professor at Berkeley, Nicholas de Mancha, works out, well, you could just plant 1,500 small copses of trees around the place instead. And that would kind of have the same effect. 95% of the same amount of rainfall would be soaked up by trees planted rather than the huge sewer. Don't tell anybody involved in the huge London sewer project. That kind of thing. Or rather do, but it's too late. Um, so that's fantastic. That's a distributed model, I'd argue, almost like a networked model. It's decentralized, if you like, in that sense. It's, a, it's not big, heavy infrastructure. It's trees. And because it's trees, it's also pulling the heat down nicely. It's creating shade, so the urban heat island problem is being mitigated. It soaks up the rainfall naturally, like I said. You can grow oranges in it because it's California. You can have kids playing in it in a way you don't really want kids playing in sewers, even in America. It's just, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's multi valent in terms of the value that it produces, as opposed to the one point, as opposed to the sewers, which basically are just sewers. They can't really grow oranges in that. I understand, maybe mushrooms. So, but this is somehow easier for the government to do than this one, it seems. It's not technically at all. It's just that it's easier for a government now at this point to write a check for 1.3 billion to a big infrastructure company than coordinate that. It's not at all, it's just the way that we've got into because we're working in a centralized rather than decentralized. We're working in a not a networked model, not a participative model. Same thing with energy, that could also go that way. Local renewable energy generated on your roof, on your house, on a block. This is in Australia, which has a lot of that, as you can imagine, but Germany has a ton of solar cells and wind in it, and last time I looked it wasn't all sunny all the time in Germany. Um, and this is a nice block which shares then the energy b between the blocks, so you don't need to generate four times the amount because of four individual houses, you generate the amount that the block needs collectively, and they share the energy between them in that way. Much more sophisticated. Uh, cooperative housing in Berlin, so this is housing uh, owner occupy bought effectively, it's just that rather than an individual taking out a mortgage, it's 20 
families or individuals taking out mortgages, depends on the scale of the thing. But it'd be like everybody in the room deciding, let's all live in one big house, let's buy the land. You do that in pretty much the same way. You, you get an architect and an engineer, obviously, to build what you need. And the result is it's about tw between 15 and 25% cheaper than going the traditional way because the profit margin of the property developer or the house builder is not in there because <laughs> they're not in there. It's you direct building the house that you need. So it's almost like the promise of you know, grand designs and shows like that, you can have an architect designed home, but actually normal people have it instead of just rich people. So genuinely interesting. And now about 15% of all Berlin's new housing, about 25%, 30% of all the housing in Zurich is cooperative in this model. So it's, you know, it's properly systemic in that sense tends to be far more interesting from a design point of view because it's designed around actual people's real needs. You're helping design it with the architect. When a property developer or someone like Barrett or Taylor Wimpy make a house, they make it as generic as possible. So, you know, they put it on the market. It might appeal to you. It might also appeal to you or, or you. But you, I suspect, have different lives <laughs> and different spatial requirements accordingly. And that doesn't, the market does not cater for that despite the rhetoric around choice. So it's an interesting model in many, many, many ways. Um, that autonomous thing I showed you before could also be used for parcel delivery and things like that. This is a project in Amsterdam. It's not real yet, but it's prototype. The prototype's real, which delivers, delivers parcels over the canals in the middle of the night. It's quiet and electric. Um, can travel without a light, actually, if necessary, because it uses computers to see rather than people's eyes, has lots of interest in things. There's fabrication, building buildings in new ways. This is very promising. Uh, in a funny way, most of the industry, again, still builds buildings the way we have for more or less the last few hundred years. People piling up bricks in the mud, which is um, not exactly a 21st century way of doing it, something. So there's loads of different options there. Different types of decision making and so on, I'll come to that. So this idea, as you see, you see it runs right across the, a lot of different things in the city, a lot of different nouns, if you like, the housing, the, the streets to some extent, the mobility and so on. They're all different approaches. They're all slightly more participative or decentralized or distributed or open in different ways. Um, I, very clearly, it's not smart cities, by the way, if you hear that phrase. Don't think it's this necessarily. I'd argue smart cities is a very different type of thing, but it is technology and we have to not be afraid of it. I'd say we can be critical of it and we can handle it very carefully for all the reasons I outlined at the start, but we can also understand what to do with it. All of that stuff I just showed you could be remarkably positive for cities. It could create more convivial places, cleaner air, safer streets, more productive businesses, and whatever you set the metric for. Low carbon cities and so on. The smart cities approach is very different. Shannon Matten described it very neatly when she said that you know, citizens relate to their city by consuming and administering its systems and by serving as sources of measurable behavioral data. That's really what the smart cities rhetoric has been for about 10, 15 years or so, which many of us have been working actively against. Uh, whereas the stuff I just showed you before is people genuinely involved, genuinely participative, genuinely actually owning the systems, not just creating data that sits in somebody else's system. So very different to the way that you exist if you do on Facebook or Google. We can't take that model and drop it into the city where your activity generates value for them. That's not really a good way to run a city. Uh, so anyway, there's lots of things with technology. As I said, these drones that uh, Amazon think might deliver parcels, I don't particularly think they will because I can't imagine we want to congest the air, having already congested the ground. The air's quite nice, as it is, to be honest. Uh, not in London, obviously, but the air could be quite nice. <laughs> um, so the last thing we probably want is some more engines flying around in it one way or another. Um, a way of doing the parcels differently, and this would be a much better way to go, to be honest, a cargo bike person has a phone in their pocket, you have an app, therefore it's a bike and it's a person turning up and these bikes can take 90% of all the deliveries in a city like London, pretty much anything smaller than a fridge freezer would go in that thing. Um, but you have an interaction with someone which is nice, it's super low carbon, obviously it's completely quiet, all of those things. Very safe, uh, super sustainable. It's also, I'd argue, a decentralized distributed on-demand real-time system. <laughs> also a guy on a bike in this case. Because if you can say, I'm not going to be home at 7, I'm going to be home at 8, click like that, then he gets the message and goes there at 8. So it's a bit like the delivery 
boy or girl we had in the 1930s and 40s where you would go to the high street and say, I'd have this fish and these vegetables, thank you. And then you'd have them bicycle to your home in some brown paper and they would be there when you got back, which seems an amazingly good system, to be honest. I'm not quite sure why we swapped that for driving to supermarkets and doing our own logistics price, I suppose. Anyway. Um, there's, and there's lots of precedents from the past. This is a lovely flower delivery vehicle from Melbourne in the 1940s. Melbourne, if you know Melbourne, has lots of little narrow laneways, so this thing is designed to go down little narrow laneways. So there's lots of lovely ideas we can draw from the past about how to do these things. I ideally, it would have an electric motor in it. Um, if you go to Japan, you see these, you know, sort of three-quarter size trucks everywhere, or everything's a bit small, which is actually really fantastic in a, in a complex city like Tokyo. It's almost like we need to make things as small as possible. If I had one message, it's let's turn big centralized things into small distributed things. Um, and that's sort of what happens in Tokyo. And we need to address this very clearly. So the problem with vans in somewhere like London, partly because of Amazon and online shopping, is, is huge. It's not just purely Amazon. It's also Ocado and everything else. Not that those aren't fantastic services in their own way, it's just the impact they have on the city is deeply problematic. So this is one of the great challenges we have. Fantastic service for the individual, deleterious outcome on the city. How do we square that off? Uh, anyway, you can see 74% increase in vans in the last 10, 15 years or so. Um, and a growth in the number of larger vans, which is exactly what we wouldn't want to have driving around in the centre of you know, pseudo-medieval city like London. But that's what's been happening. Nonetheless, again, there are other ways of doing things. UBS, the Swiss bank, who are hardly a bunch of hippies, uh, reckon that, you know, again, you could significantly address the amount of private cars and vehicles driving in a city if you had some kind of self-driving thing. The key thing, is it shared or not? Is it doing multiple jobs? So when we say self-driving cars, to be clear, I sort of prefer talking about buses just to be super simplistic about it. A bus is not the same as a car. <laughs> the self-driving bit can be the same, but there's a huge difference between a, car, a, bar, a bus and a car. What they talk about is the urban car ownership could drop by 70% or so because you have other options. There are many different ways you can get around and they come to you and they work. Still relying on things like the tube as well as the base load of transport in a city like London, but then all of the individual in sort of in the gaps, awkward journeys that people currently have private cars for because it gives you lots of flexibility. Well, there's ways that we can address that with this kind of technology, one way or another. But don't think of it as a private car that you currently drive being replaced for a private car where you're watching it drive. That seems like a pointless switch, really. This is more interesting. So this is uh, by Johnny Culkin, an industrial designer, a sketch of what if Transport for London had these little minibuses. They sit in the gap between bikes and feet and tube and big bus. <laughs> you have these things in the middle. And they can be on routes or they not be on routes. They can come to you. They can do things that you have to go to a bus stop or a tube stop for. They're doing all of the interesting little journeys, going to pick up the kids playing football, going to drop something off at your grandmother's house that you currently have the private car for. That could happen with this kind of thing. The really interesting thing is he's drawn it as TFL. You know, why wouldn't it be TFL? Why would it have to be Uber in the popular imagination? It could completely be TFL. There's no, there's no magic about it. Like I said, it's available now. Helsinki are doing it as their equivalent of Transport for London. And what would that do to the streets is interesting. So this is some work we've done where you're looking at, well, if you have these cars, and of course this is very speedy, though, <laughs> and all the safety is baked into those things, then you don't need to create the safety built into the road so much. You don't need traffic lights and pedestrian crossings and curbs and things like that necessarily. Necessarily. If you're designing a place that only had these kinds of vehicles, say bikes and those shuttles and the cargo bikes, then you start saying, well, hang on, why do we need traffic lights again? We just, if things are moving slower, and the, you saw the thing in Helsinki, it's going about 15 kilometers an hour, very slow, on purpose. How fast should things go in a city? It wasn't a whole separate conversation, but arguably we've made them move too fast over too great a distance for a very long time, and that's been baked into the way that planners think about it. In fact, if we slowed everything down and made it work that way, it could work far better, I suspect. But it's just not the done thing in that practice. Um, so if they were slowed down like that, and then you start stripping away all of the things, you end up with the street, which is more like a kind of continuous piazza or something, you know, it's like a, it's just all public space. 
they're in this division. And in fact, the curbs that we have in London streets are really a leftover from when we had horses anyway. It's where you sweep the horse crap against the side of the road. That's why we have curbs. It's not any other reason. <laughs> um, but we sort of forget that now. Um, traffic lights and things like that, they don't have to exist in the future. So and imagine how much nicer the street could be if we had those things. So it becomes this kind of question about this kind of dynamic of the streets and everything sort of moving at a continuous, slowish, but continuous, seem smooth pace. And of course, that is how cities used to be. This is Sydney in 1906. Um, and you look at this constant flow of things moving in all directions. There's no edge really between, there is a pavement, but basically these people are just ignoring it, standing in the middle of the street. You know, it's kind of flowing backwards and forwards. Um, I'll play that again. Um, so you get what Jane Jacobs called the ballet of the street. You see this sort of, this, uh, orchestration of things and humans able to coordinate very naturally, as did horses, of course. As soon as we studied engineering that, you started getting accidents, I have to say. This sort of works. There were other issues in cities at that time. Sydney had the bubonic plague, two streets to the left in 1904. So I'm not saying it's all great or anything, but certainly from a street life point of view, that was very fluid and organic and you could wander through things and hop on things, hop off them, and it had this flow to it. And that can really work very beautifully. So the question of what the street is, this isn't work by us, it's by the Dutch firm NVRDV. Is this a street in the future? You know, is this kind of what you have in green lanes? <laughs> um, it's an open question. It's probably too green for many places and it would be horribly muddy in winter, obviously. So I'm not suggesting it for reals, but I'm just putting it there to say, what is the idea of the street that we have in our heads? The gap between buildings. And this isn't just about autonomous things, just to be clear. Paris is working very hard to remove its cars from its streets. It has a real problem with traffic, as you probably know if you've been to Paris, but nonetheless working very hard to do so. Oslo is more or less completely getting rid of, rid of private cars from the center of Oslo, which is fantastic, I would argue. Barcelona is unlocking its kind of secret weapon, the superblock, which has been lying there latent since about 1880. And now they sort of, sort of can begin to start making it work, where you have the traffic going through over the main arteries, and then within this, everything slows right down to, again, about 15 kilometers an hour, 10 kilometers an hour, and so on. And you begin to unlock the, the idea of that in a very different way. Um, when we look at the way we approach mobility from the government point of view, their grand challenge at the moment, which I'll come to later, is not set out in that in mind. It basically says, let's make zero emission cars and vans, full stop doesn't really talk about the systemic effect on things like the streets, the, what I was just talking to you about, and all of the benefits you would get from that. Um, and I think they're missing a trick in many ways. They're sort of missing the fact that car use in the UK has arguably peaked a while ago and is beginning to drop. Young people are not getting driving licenses in the numbers at all, anything like it, that you did if you grew up in the 80s or the 90s. Just not happening. Nonetheless, the Department for Transport, in a sort of hammer, only sees nails kind of way, see the predicted car use going up, <coughs> up and up. And I don't quite know where their data comes from. They're not really looking at the proper behavioral data about that, I think. Uh, and if you look at the transport model, actually, um, when you click on it on the government website, you get a page which was archived in 2011, which <laughs> maybe says a lot right there. So there is another idea behind cars that I would say that maybe cars become like horses, actually. And that there's something that you do at the weekend for fun. You know, sort of might be quite nice. You could go for a tootle around in the country. That's, that's all right. That's a nice thing to do in a car, I, I imagine. Uh, you could have a nice service where you could say, I'll sign up for that service. And this weekend, it's a Maserati. Next weekend, it's an original VW Beetle. The weekend after, it's a Ferrari 328. You know, like that's I can imagine that could work really nicely. But to get people around in the middle of a 10 million person city like London or a 600,000 city like Sheffield, that's an odd thing to do. So I think we can try, we can try a lot harder in terms of understanding, sorry, bloody technology. <laughs> uh, the way we can think about cars, it's not that the car itself isn't necessarily a bad thing. The way we use it is deeply problematic, just as the horse <laughs> could be. Uh, deeply problematic, as we saw from the way, reason we had to invent curbs. Um, when you look at things like Uber and Lyft, which they would say, well, perhaps we're the answer to mobility in cities, actually they're not the answer at all. I, again, I would argue they're slowing down traffic, but not in the right way. They're not slowing it down on purpose, <laughs> strategically. 
it's just massively congesting the city. There's 18,000 Ubers in London on a Friday night. You know, it's just an extraordinary number that TfL sort of didn't really see coming. Um, so the congestion charge pulled out about 23,000 cars out of central London. It was more or less put it more back in in different guys in a few years, which is not good. So this is the average speed in Manhattan going down um, based on data, apparently mainly to do with Uber and Lyft ride sharing. If you think about it, those are bits of software optimized to get drivers onto the road. You see it from that side of the system. That's why when you pick it out of your pocket, there is a car sort of magically there. It's because the system is optimized for to be as many cars as possible, as close to you as possible, which is, again, fantastic from an individual point of view, terrible from a city point of view. So great user experience design, terrible urban design from a designer. I'd say they're doing a great job on the app end of stuff, not a great job on the city end of things. We need to see those are connected, they're absolutely connected, joined at the hip. The deputy mayor of Paris, um, you can just look at the red bit here, is really interesting. He's, he's saying things, it hasn't quite followed through on the policy yet, but nonetheless, it's interesting. They're saying that by 2020, we'll only have uh, shared autonomous vehicles. That's the AV, autonomous vehicle. So we'll only have shared autonomous vehicle, not private. For him to say that is an amazing statement in itself, I think. Our deputy minister of transport say nothing along those lines at all at the moment. So he's saying, we'll only have these kind of buses or shared taxi things. We won't have, you know, Reiner won't have his private autonomous Audi at that point driving into the middle of Paris. Sorry, Reiner. Um, and then, when, when, then when we look at transport back in the UK, again, I mean, I just know it falls down in many, many ways. So this was a train I was on a few weeks ago. This is Cambridge to London, in theory, like a very wealthy, professional, 21st century, knowledge archy kind of place. <laughs> um, and it's appalling. I mean, I cannot tell you how bad the service is generally, but this is jam-packed on a, just like this. It's just utterly, shockingly bad, I'd argue, as a train service. I, I hardly need point out to you. Um, and I started making a list of all of the things wrong from a user experience design point of view, which again, no minister really has ever paid attention to, but still. And then we can look at the cost as well. I mean, look at the cost of Velletri to Rome in Italy, the same distance, 23 miles per annum, is 442 pounds in Italy, it's 3,248 pounds in the UK. You can get the entire German rail network on a barn card for 3,795 pounds per annum. Just to go Peterborough to King's Cross is twice as much. I mean, it's just, it's hard to fathom that we've let that happen for something as significant as rail. And when you look back then at the industrial strategy and you say, what's the future mobility challenge? Zero emission cars and vans. Are trains not moving things? I mean, you know, that we tend to use and it's not even really part of the picture. Buses also not part of the picture. And we know that they've suffered hugely. I grew up in Sheffield in the eighties when it was actually a very nice service. You could get a bus anywhere in the city as a kid for two pence. Any amount of time, any distance. Extraordinarily liberating thing. Now it's not like that, I'll just say that. Elsewhere, this is sort of happening. In the UK, this is our attempt at autonomous mobility. In, in Greenwich, it's kind of a clown car with Vince Cable in the back. So it's not really, <laughs> um, not the same thing. Cycling data, we're down here in the list in terms of people participating in cycling. There's the rest of the world, more or less. Meanwhile, bike sharing is huge. You know, these uh, Chinese bike sharing firms are deeply problematic again in lots of other ways, but somehow they're raising billions of pounds of investment into bikes, and the UK industrial strategy doesn't even mention them. Housing, so we talked about this cooperative model before. Baugruppen in Berlin is where it's really taken off, and this is what I meant about the, the way it's shaped around real people's needs because the people are involved in the design. So this garden, was built by all of the people together, or designed with the architects by all the people together, because there were lots of kids in all of those houses, and so they said, let's just make one big shared garden, instead of having a little tiny plot each. Makes perfect sense. And then, you know, four of us parents can look after 20 kids simultaneously this way. That doesn't happen when you're approaching it from the market side purely, pure market side. This is stuff in Japan for Muji, this is in Melbourne, and it, frankly, in, if you can do it in Melbourne, you can totally do it in the UK. This is a property owning culture off the charts compared to the UK and they're managing to get cooperative housing at scale out of Melbourne. Just because that 
you know, those dollars go back to you, the buyer. That's the sell in Australia. More sustainable housing, better quality, cheaper. It's kind of an unbeatable hand. Uh, so in Switzerland, this, again, on huge scale, it's, this is a huge block. 13 buildings, 50 co-ops involved, car-free, shared infrastructure. The rent's 20, 30% below market <coughs> levels with no public subsidy, really. Just you don't have a property developer driving it. And as soon as you get a property developer, they're looking for that 20 to 30% as their profit margin, as you would if you were them. You don't have to have a property developer to make a building. It's not that hard, <laughs> really. So can we take the dynamics of these things and rebake them in different ways? You know, can we, can we find a way of borrowing all this stuff we've been talking about and shape it into something that makes sense for the UK or for Europe or whatever you want to think of it? I think there's a very strong European message, I would say, here as a European, that there's a particularly we're well placed to approach that, seeing the UK in Europe, just to be clear. For example, City Mapper. Who uses City Mapper out of interest on their phones? Let's say about 20% of the room. So, it uh, gets you around, it's got good directions in it. Um, when they announced the fact they were making a bus, because they launch a bus service in London, they said on their blog post, note to Silicon Valley, it's a social, hyper-local, multi-passenger pooled vehicle. Note to the rest of the world, it's a bus. <laughs> I mean, it's just a bus. But you know, in Silicon Valley, they don't really know what a bus is, so you have to tell them it's all of that stuff, just to get them interested. But it's really just a bus. So, I mean, it's a good bus. It's got Wi-Fi on it and USB charging and stuff, but it's basically a bus. So how do we take these things and what do we do with them? So a work that I've done in Melbourne with my team on streets like this, where this is, a, this is a street purportedly. In fact, it's just full of cars. There's not really a person in there or this street. This is a real photo. So, um, you know, there, there is a person in there, but I defy you to find them. <laughs> it's just sort of sitting there all day, kind of it's hot metal ticking in the sun. Uh, not the best use of that space where the CBD, the central business district, is right there. So how do we change this and develop it over time? How does it begin to transform? So first thing we do is we start saying, let's gather some data about it. Let's put some Wi-Fi in there and maybe some simple equipment that can understand the pattern of use of these cars. When are they actually coming and going? What are the dynamics during the day? We just need to understand that at that level of the street. Then we can say, well, the parking there is in a line. <coughs> what if we angle that up? If we angle that up, we can get the cars from the right-hand side the left-hand side, still more or less the same amount of parking, but now we can sneak a bike lane in there. Cyclists without helmets for the Australians in the room, that was deliberately done to annoy people. Mm -hmm. um, so we're beginning to change the mobility now, so perhaps now we can pro drop in a bike sharing hub, let's test that autonomous shuttle. We don't know if it's going to work, so we have to try it, we have to prototype, test something. So let's try a small scale test, see if it works. Maybe it does, in which case we're beginning to change the mobility even more, there's a bit more amenity here now. Uh, thus, we can begin to borrow a bit more of the street back for planting and greenery. This attracts different kind of usage to it and so on, till you can make this bigger move where we say you can still drive down that left-hand side if you want to because the streets are so wide, but you can now begin to see that, oh, you know what, we could actually have all kinds of activity going on now. So now you have kids playing football, you have a cooler street environment because it's mitigating the heat from the sun because of the greenery, it's soaking rainwater up naturally as I pointed out before, the businesses are probably doing better because there's increased footfall. The property value has gone up. If you want it to go up, it'll go up. All of those things are happening. Different mobility choices. The people are healthier because they're walking and cycling more and so on and so on and so on. So what you can't do, though, as you probably know if you've done this kind of work, is you can't go to Melbourne and say, right, we're going to move all your cars because <laughs> you will probably get killed. Um, so getting from that to that, it's not hard to draw this. It's really hard to do it. So that's the thing. And so we talk about this much more adaptable, agile approach where we're just doing one step at a time. We've got a direction which we can talk about in terms of outcomes. So do we want people to be healthier? Probably. By how much? Do we want the air to be cleaner? Yeah, I would guess so. Do we want the businesses to do better? Sure. And so on and so on. We can set those objectives of outcomes. And what we're not going to promise is that we know all of the steps in advance as to how to get there. Currently, the way that policy and planning works, you have to pretend we know all the steps in advance. You have to basically hand in the drawing and say, this is what's going to happen in 2028 for sure. And everybody kind of crosses their fingers and signs it off, and then you go, and that doesn't really happen. This says, well, we're going to set those outcomes, and by the time we get to here, we're going to try the thing with the autonomous shuttle. If it doesn't work, we'll try something else. We'll try an e-bike sharing network or something. We can actually move around a bit. You've still got the trajectory, but you have options as to how you get there. It's not rocket science, I know, but it's understanding the different rate of change 
So a diagram we use there is Stuart Brand's diagram, borrowed from Frank Duffy originally, which is saying that a building moves at different speeds. The structure of the building doesn't change much. This one has been here since the 80s or whatever. Hopefully we'll be here another 100 years or so. Um, whereas, I don't know, the lights might change, for sure. The Wi-Fi changes quickly. The chairs can change on an hourly basis as required. So the building itself is sort of shearing these layers against each other. Um, so any kind of district, we did this stuff for a place in Westland, an old oak common, um, has a slow layer, railway stations, wetlands, landscaping, and things like this. They're the long-term plays. The landscaping is a long-term play. The rail station, maybe that's a 200-year bet. You have to make it work. You can't put it in and then go, oh, that didn't work after three years. Let's not do a railway station. <laughs> not going to happen. There's a fast layer as well, which could be anything from an app, like a shared tools app, through to things like solar cells, because solar cells as a technology are moving quite fast. So you might put them on your roof and then say, actually, in three years, there's a new one. I'm going to try that one, take the old one off, put the new one on. So you can begin to do that. And that's interesting, because that's energy, which used to be a slow system, as in it would come along pylons from the countryside, not really changeable. And it's becoming a fast layer. You can deliver it, test it, take it off if it doesn't work. A bit more like software, but not quite. So we have super slow, slow, fast, super fast. We begin to stack all of those up against all of these infrastructures. Don't worry, I'm not supposed to read it. <laughs> um, we then play those out as systems because we understand they're all related to each other. So for Old Oak, we said, you know, what if it can take waste from another district nearby? <coughs> it puts the waste into a resource center and extracts the goodness from the waste one way or another. And any excess, it turns into heat and energy down here through these plants. And then it can feed that heat and electricity into rooftop farming, which is kind of a faster layer. And then you might have some bit of logistics like this, which comes and takes that, or a train that does that, which is nice. And then that generates food, which goes into the market, which is a very fast layer, because that's a cultural layer, one way or another. And then that creates waste, which goes back in here. So this is kind of a circle. It's called a circular economy approach, built of fast and slow layers together, and you're understanding which bit's moving at different speeds. Meanwhile, in Oslo, they've got this amazing bike sharing system. <laughs> and it's really one of the best in the world, I think, for many reasons. They use the data incredibly in a sophisticated way. They work with Google on that and some of the analytics. Beautiful industrial design, really clever system in lots of different ways. Its usage per capita is off the charts compared to, say, with London or New York or Melbourne or equivalent. Part of it, I thing I like about it is this kind of characterful thing as well. It understands that it's, it's for Oslo. So it kind of has this uh, very playful approach that they work very carefully with citizens on um, conveying the idea of the bike sharing system. And then they looked into lots of different ways of making the citizens felt like they own it. They wanted citizens to actually look after the bikes as well. That's massively in their interest as an operator. But they had whole campaigns about shared maintenance of the bikes because they the way they framed it is this is the city's bike which it is so it's called oslo bicycle oslo bike sharing in london as you may know sometime there <laughs> or previously barclays you know those well-loved local brands <laughs> um, so there it's just the city's bike it's the city's bike it belongs to you it belongs to us it's all and we're all in this together the operator but it belongs to the city very clever little techniques. You know, again, this is a fast, slow layer in action. They know that people will use an app to unlock it. So instead of making incredibly complex housing for that, they just use two rubber bands. So you can plug your phone in because they know that you're going to change your phone every couple of years. You don't want to change the bike every couple of years. So really sophisticated system. They share the data openly with the city. So they feed data back to the city about what's happening in the system and where they're seeing, oh, there's a gap here, by the way. You might want to run a tram down there because they're seeing lots of action in this way, and they open it up so everybody can build on top of it as well. They put the bike, these are the most popular names in Oslo, and also all the bikes have a local name on it, and then someone might ride the bike with their name on it and take a picture on Instagram saying, I rode the bike with my name on it. You know, it's sort of just, that's a really tiny little detail, but all of this is about creating a connection, and I'd argue actually quite ultimately a meaningful connection if you scale that up to 600,000 people using it between you and the system and the bike and the city. For full Nordic brownie points, <laughs> the maintenance crew that goes out in the morning is recently released offenders from prison. <laughs> so while they're in prison, they train people to fix bikes. They used to train them to be blacksmiths, which not terribly useful in 21st century Oslo. 
Um, so they train them how to fix bikes, and then they come out, and then they're the crew. So their integration into society is sort of built into the system. Again, it's completely rounded. They didn't have to do that, but that's a fantastic way of having a maintenance crew, actually, from their point of view as well. But it really, again, creates a relationship with the city, which they fully understand. It's not done because it's a cheap source of labor, as arguably Santander might do. It's because it's the right thing to do to create a connection with the city. Interestingly, in the UK, I mean, we, we pursue, I talked to them the other day about this one. In the UK, there's this fantastic project at the moment called In-House Records. A guy has set up a record label inside prisons because the level of violence in UK prisons is astonishingly high, partly because prisoners are unemployed all the time in the prison. They have really nothing to do. So they're bored out of their minds and they're infantilized in numerous ways. So they re-offend, effectively, inside and outside. So in-house records has given them a record label and they've started recording music, marketing music, learning how to edit, um, you know, use a desk. Um, positive behavior has increased by 428% in the last couple of years in the six prisons it's working in. So it's fantastic. And so what we can't do in the UK is then connect that to something like a bike sharing system because they're completely different things. And that's one of the problems that we're now wrangling with from a strategic design point of view. Clearly, as Oslo shows, you can connect prisons to bikes. <laughs> and uh, that is the Home Office, and that's the Ministry of Transport currently in the UK, or the, the urban equivalent of. We could put that together in a different way, just as I showed the circular system before, with benefit both sides. Really hard to do that. Traditionally, there's no reason why you can't. More happy Nordic people, I'll skip for that, because it's, it's depressingly nice. So the way they talk about it, flexibility for the individual, civic outcomes for the city, and efficiency for the operator. It was kind of not complex, but um, only not complex if you think about it and then do it in that way. Um, stuff that we've done with bikes in a previous team was looking at, you know, how do you, how do, you do wayfinding on a bike, things like this. These are sort of tests of how we might use technology in the city. I'm not saying this is an answer, that you'd have a head-up display on your bike helmet, because that's a very expensive bike helmet, potentially, although not crazy expensive. Um, but it, what we flushed out during the research was that cyclists move in interesting ways through cities. Cyclists can go down here in a way that cars can't, can't go down there. So if you use TomTom -tom or Google Maps to, as a driver, it's not going to show you that. Um, as a cyclist might want to do that. But how do you do that whilst they can stay heads up and not looking down at a phone while they're cycling? Because you'll die in London if you do that. So we're looking at where do we use the tech in just the right way to do one or two things? Again, not the answer, but more of a question. Can we use the head-up display to look through a building and say, you're, you're going down there, and then you'll see the shard and turn right? If we do that, then actually the, the rider learns how to read the city. That's a nice thing to do. It means that, again, their head's up. After the, she's done that twice, she can take the visor off. Just, I go down there, I turn the shard, I turn right. So she's learned to read the landscape, which is how the best way of doing wayfinding, actually. So we're using the tech there to disappear at some point. And finally, you know, we could get the tech to do one thing, just very subtly. This is just saying the clean air is to the left right now. So you turn that way. So that, that would be very useful in London as a, as a cyclist. And it's likely to take you down quieter streets, which are safer and so on. Um, technically possible. And we're using this again to say that isn't a real thing. That's a bit of sci-fi film, to be honest, but everything in there is technically plausible. So we put that in front of people, as, as I just did with you and the in-house records and the bike sharing thing, put it in front of you as an idea. Um, we need to understand how these things will work. So when I talked about the shared autonomous vehicle earlier, we made this short film for another client um, looking at, well, how is that going to work? You know, we need to understand, in this case, Anna is going to call an autonomous shuttle, a little bus, to her. Will she trade off time against money like this? Will she share it with someone else, or does she just want a vehicle for herself? And then how are we going to tell her where to go on the street? We just made this in our office. So it's, um, apologies for the terrible acting by my team. That's not why they're employed. But uh, so this little totem was doing something else a minute ago. Now it's become a bus stop for a minute, because there's a thing heading for her. Then it'll stop being a bus stop in a minute. But because, <laughs> because they can. Uh, don't look at the camera. Um, because they're walking past and going, well, I wasn't going that way for half an hour, but seeing as Anna's made a bus happen, we might as well hop in. Is that a likely scenario? That's now the conversation we can have. We've put that in front of you. Previously, what happens in consultants' reports, I have to say, is usually there'd just be a bullet point saying, we'll have a shared autonomous bus system. Next bullet point. <laughs> 
I was like, whoa, hang on a minute, how's that going to happen? You know, are, are people going to do it? There's behavioral research we can do about that. What do we need to make that happen? Maybe we need these totem things, which are doing local information and weather and time and events, and then they become a bus stop for a minute, and then they go back to being something else. They're a new character in the street. That could be interesting, and so on. So we do this work in Sheffield at the moment, where um, Sheffield is you know, interesting in lots of ways, very, very successful at some things, and not at all at others, put it that way. One thing they're struggling with is the retail dropout, which is happening up and down the country, as you probably know, Debenhams, House of Fraser, John Lewis, all of these things are in big trouble. Mainly because of Amazon, mainly because of changing habits, but mainly because of Amazon. Um, Amazon's not going to replace all those jobs, and it's not going to replace all that space. So Amazon takes jobs out of the economy very clearly, and wealth also, likewise, if you're not, unless you're in Seattle. In which case you'd probably, well actually no, because the tax breaks are probably very favourable. Even in Seattle it's probably not doing much. But it's certainly problematic in terms of the space of a city centre like Sheffield, which was thinking we're going to have retail, retail, retail for the last 15 years, and then actually no we're not. <laughs> Maybe 20% of what we had will be retail. And you look at, well, what might be immune to Amazon? This is work that Morgan Stanley did. Well, dollar stores or pound shops in UK language might be immune to Amazon. Well, they could because they're so cheap. It's not going to be in Amazon's headlights. But you can't really build a city centre around that, or you wouldn't really want to. So we've looked at all kinds of other alternatives. This is, again, digital transformation, something like Amazon, impacting on retail and other things like this. We looked at this tiny bar in Sheffield called Public. It's in a form of public toilet. It's underneath the town hall. It's very lovely. It's a cocktail bar. Smaller than this room, I have to say. But everything in it was made in Sheffield. Everything, the crockery, the graphic design, the joinery, the architecture, the Arctic monkeys were from Sheffield. The drummer did a soundtrack for the bar. I mean, it's just sort of, again, holistic. Um, meanwhile, a new Boeing factory opened in the city, on the edge of the city, and everybody's very excited about the new Boeing factory because it's making Airbus parts. The Boeing factory employs 29 people. <laughs> it's basically a big robot. That, you know, I don't even know what the 29 people are there to do, to be honest. Um, this bar employs more people, if you look at it. <laughs> and when you look at the numbers, you know, when it's a local independent like this, when you spend a quid there, something between 52 and 66 pence of the pound stays in Sheffield, in this case, stays in the local economy because of this knock-on in terms of local players. With a franchise, let's say that was Costa or Starbucks, then only about 14 pence stays in there because it all heads probably to London and then elsewhere. Um, independent retailers create twice as many jobs than Amazon would do over the same period. So Amazon's been growing, second biggest company in the world. Independent retailers create more jobs, which is interesting. So we've started to lay out a different city centre. We put all the stuff I've shown in before, but we're also now talking about jobs and automation and what's going to happen in Sheffield. Do we start talking about these kind of combined housing, live workspaces with studio space and things like that, where people can live there and make things at the same time? Do you have stuff made in the advanced manufacturing district on the edge of the city, shipped in by cargo bikes overnight, assembled locally in the back and sold out the front? Again, you get this local um, business idea, but it's fully 21st century and creates tons of jobs. So these are the things we started playing out. And the value of independent retail is a bit like the Oslo city bike. It, it creates a mark in the city. It's distinctive. So when you see an independent retailer, like this one in Berlin, it's, it's different to if you then go to Dusseldorf and you see a different one there. Whereas if you see WH Smiths in Peterborough and Nantwich, <laughs> nothing really about those places. So it, it's, it, it generates a lot locally, but it wouldn't feature in any economic model, like I can guarantee you from the Treasury about city economies. I'd also argue it creates a massive presence. This identity thing is really important. These are, when I lived in Helsinki, studios in Helsinki, you just see them in the street and you see people making things. You're walking past and then it gives this sense of this is what this city is about. Or, this is what this bit of the city is about. We're making things and it creates a character and identity there. That would be different to in Tallinn or different to Stockholm in some way. Not that different, obviously. Um, when we look at the library, the linchpin of the city, we first of all, we're stacking up, well, what have people spent on libraries recently around the world? What have they made? What kind of volume of building are we talking about? So really significant, you know, 96 million euros spent on the new Helsinki Public Library, 640,000 people live in Helsinki. Sheffield is about 575, 580, so broadly the same kind of size really has nothing to work with in terms of capital to make that 
anything like that at all. So this is a huge problem around austerity and north-south divide and so on. But we're trying to then build a case, then say, well, how would you understand how, what a library is? And then what kind of value would that generate? And then what could you do in the city? So different ways of thinking about the library. These are different sort of crazy architectural sketches we're doing. Again, very early conceptual stuff. We do research. We find that the library, the current library, is actually very well populated. It's actually really well used. Not what the narrative is, by the way. And library numbers have been rocketing up all over the world, by the way, particularly among so-called millennials, go to libraries more than they used to, equivalent age groups, except in the UK. Um, because we've halved the opening hours in library, more or less, because we've had 45% budget cuts to local libraries. So turns out if you close the doors, it's really hard to get into a library. I don't know. Well, I'm not an expert, but anyway. Um, we came up with a participation strategy to help the city figure out how to build a library, what to do with it, and then started looking at the kind of value across multiple things that a library might generate, not just financial value, not just, say, the number of books lent and borrowed and such like, because that's just some tiny thing that libraries do now. But businesses created, local value created, culture created, pop property increase, even all of those things. You can draw a line between those things. You can draw a line between people going to the library and getting healthier. There is research to support that. But again, try and take money from the NHS budget and put it into the library pot as a preventative measure. That is traditionally very hard to do. But again, we can draw a line between those things. We have to understand how to cut across these silos and do this better. Not to take money from the NHS, but to prevent spending money on acute care when we could spend it on prevention in the first place. So citizens are key to all of the all of these strategies I've shown you, citizens are heavily involved, and I hope you're beginning to see now. Um, and even when those good cities I mentioned earlier, like Oslo's of this world and so on, are trying to remove cars from their city centre, of course that, they meet resistance as well. Not as much as they do in Melbourne, but still, still quite a lot. And then we look at the way that we communicate with citizens. So let's look at in the UK, how do we communicate with citizens about planning, about how something is going to happen in your neighbourhood? So this could be a development at the end of your street, it could be a 10-storey block of flats, or it could be a door changing from automatic to manual. We basically tie a piece of paper to a lamppost in the rain, and we hope you might look at it. <laughs> Brackets secretly, maybe hope you don't look at it. I, don't, I couldn't possibly comment, but still. That's the best we can do in a 21st century city like London with untold wealth, with Apple watches and flying taxis. We tie a piece of paper to a lamppost in the rain. And of course, I mean, it's, it's written in the language of the Town and Country Planning Act. It says in big letters, um, what is it? It's gonna, there we go. How does this affect you? It's like, what, how does what? Something's gonna affect me. What, really? Oh no. You're immediately into like a contentious conversation about something. I use this Philip Glass soundtrack to make it extra sad, just in case you know. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it ends up kind of down the ankles of a lamppost, like a metaphor for the planning system. It's just, uh, you know, it's just embarrassing. And this is our primary means. You might get a letter through the post if you're lucky, but really those, must, those would end up in the bin as well. If you actually then try to like click on, you can't click on the link, obviously, it's a piece of paper. You can't QR code it, you can't do anything thing like that. It's then got a link you have to type in onto something. Are you going to do that on your phone, really? And then you go to the website, and I can tell you the website is just as bad, just in HTML instead of on a lamppost. So anyway, we can do better than that, I suspect. So uh, there's loads of amazing stuff going around participation. This is a lovely work in Chile, in um, Constitucion, when they had to rebuild the city very quickly after a tsunami and earthquake flattened most of the city. In 90 days, they remaster planned the whole city, a city of 50,000 people. So a city like, you know, Loughborough was basically wiped out. And they remaster planned the whole thing. They built a dedicated space for it downtown to have discussions in one side of the room. And then the other side of the room, they had architects and engineers working in real time in CAD, throwing drawings backwards and forwards from the debate to the drawing, to the debate, to the drawing. So was, the whole thing was almost like this conversation in real time. What if we did this? What if we did this? Well, we'll just go and check. Really powerful, amazing ideas came out of it, and of course, huge approval rating for the plan, and people more or less lived happily ever after, not quite, but still. <laughs> um, we did a similar project in Helsinki, looking at how do you get people to contribute suggestions about places, instead of just complaining about things, could you suggest something? I'd like to get into that vacant shop front and make it a flower shop. 
I'd like to get into that vacant car park and turn it into a playground. There's an open platform across the city for property developers as well as normal people, <laughs> um, all points in between. How, how you then pitch the idea, the city supports you, you get backing from people and so on and so on. There's a really interesting project that I'm a trustee of for full uh, disclosure called Participatory City Working in Barking and Dagenham, which is ninth most deprived borough in the UK, I believe, or it's in that order. Um, and it's an amazing project. So go, just go and look at participatorycity.org. They're doing some really lovely work. And they found, on the basis that they found only 3% of people in the UK are involved in their neighbourhood projects, probably because of planning notices and things like that. But 60% would like to work with other people to do things in their neighbourhood. So people often say that, sure, so maybe it's not 60, maybe it's 40, but even, I don't know, but it's a huge number compared to the number that currently feel they can get involved. And the impact of that is enormous. You know, 60% increase in trust in neighbours if you work together in your neighbourhood. Sense of pride and ownership up and up. This is um, data that Participatory City got from a previous trial they did. Sense of safety increases. I mean, just all round good metrics. So look at the every one, every day project embarking there. In a similar sense, I just say in uh, Berlin, different way of doing it. Um, the city ran out of money because Berlin does that from time to time. And they used to plant trees in the verges of streets up and down the city. And in, they ran out of money. And in Schoenberg, uh, residents started planting themselves. So they didn't have a permit for this or anything. It was probably vaguely illegal, but certainly wasn't official. But uh, it turns out, of course, that's really lovely because every apartment block has different people in it. So as you walk down the streets, you're seeing different plants being planted, all tended by the people who live in the place. So in a block like that, when you've got, I don't know, 10 apartments, you can pretty much get it looked after fairly well. I mean, they're very nice verges, I have to say, <laughs> as a fan of gardens. Um, but they're all different and diverse. Whereas when it was municipal planting, it was all the same plants multiplied across 400 streets, because that's the cheapest and most efficient way of doing it. Whereas engaging citizens in it meant that it could be kind of diverse and still quite high quality. So there's an interesting tension here about what can citizens do by themselves and when does the city need to step in? So you wouldn't maybe get the citizens to do the heavy maintenance in the streets. That's clearly like something a municipality needs to do. But does the how can the municipality create space for citizens to take ownership of things that could be done by them? And how will that work and scale outside of Schoenberg, which is a little bit hipster, if I must say, um, where they do this kind of thing? So this is, again, the work we've been doing in Sheffield to explain the plan to people. And one thing we did was we drew this plan by hand, put it in the streets. So rather than use a digital model, which we had, we had a full 3D model of the city in, in CAD, for those that are technical in the room, we actually printed it out and then traced it by hand, which really annoyed people in our office. But it was the right thing to do in terms of engaging people, because when we put it in the streets and then observed how people interacted with it, this guy who was in his 80s easily pointed to this bit of the city and said, my grandfather used to keep cattle there. And that would not have happened in, with the 3D model. It's just, you know, it's just more engaging. It still conveys the same thing, but the, the mode was the right one. So when we're talking about this work, the most important thing is to understand the people and the situation and the context of that, not assume it's a digital tool. If you did want to do a digital tool, then it can be done. So you know, one prototype we've built out is this one, looking at what if you had a kind of augmented reality planning notice if you held your tablet over something in the street and it showed you this is a proposal for that space. That's a battery storage unit. Someone else said maybe a cafe would be nice. Someone else has a proposal for um, a community garden and then somebody else says, I like the community garden, but what about a bike rack? You know, this is then a platform you can have this conversation in. We're not saying that that is then you just do thumbs up, thumbs down because that's too simplistic. Um, who would do a big yes, no vote about a complex subject like Brexit? Um, you wouldn't do that with something that you can't <laughs> deal with in a more sophisticated way. If you put a bike rack there, it can't then be, I don't know, a playground in quite the same way. So these are mutually exclusive. So it's more, you have to then say, let's have the meeting on Thursday, you can come along. At the meeting, we think you could also use a bit of tech as well. You, we might have a physical model like this of a development, but you could sort of then use the 
um, data to then say this is the amount of sunlight falling on this building if you have it this way round. If you turn the building round, it's half the sunlight, so maybe you want to plant. Don't plant tomatoes, you can plant kale. <laughs> um, you know, that's the sort of thing, or don't, don't put solar cells on in the second way, put it on in the first way. So these were then built by our partners on this one who are Ericsson, working with UN Habitat in Johannesburg and school kids and using Minecraft. Minecraft, they, they got the kids to model Minecraft, the whole area that they lived in, and then to model modifications they'd like to see to the area. And then they walked outside with a phone and saw their modifications dropped into the street. And this is very early sketchy prototypes. It's all a bit jittery and it's not quite right, but it's surprisingly good straight away. This is on a vaguely normal phone, a Google Tango phone. Um, and not to say that you would ever want to build that <laughs> necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily, but it's really getting the idea at the very earliest age of you know eight-year-olds that you can change the city, you can be part of this in some way. This, this is a place where you can make suggestions just as much as I can, just as much as a developer can. So that, that insight is, was something we built specifically around these kinds of projects. And then finally, I'd say that the EU project Decode, which we're part of, is then where does that data sit? Who does it belong to? And as a citizen, how can I have control over what people can and can't do with my data? That's a fundamental project there. I think I might leave it there, Reiner, because uh, I could go on, but I think um, that's not a bad place to stop. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Tan. I think you have to move the chair here as well. Folks, I did that. So we now have time for a few questions. Could I just ask, was that oh. Einstein on the beach? Wait for the mic. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't, but uh, good call. <laughs> it was, I'm trying to think what it was. It was Philip Glass, anyway. Yeah. So yeah, you're right composer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look it up for you if you like. I can't remember. I wanted right. something suitably solid. <laughs> right. oh, we're from California. When I was a boy, I rode around on those red cars you talked about with the highly ramified rail system, which was ripped out. Yeah, because right. Because tire manufacturers and automobile manufacturers saw more, more loop in combustible yeah. engines. Well, uh, there is a problem in the way the economy is structured, isn't there? Take, for example, it, it's sort of in the kind of capitalism we have, Someone gets a bright idea. Hey, I see how to make some money. Let's get into that right away. So you see an offshoot of Uber with these electric scooters mm. that are just flourishing like mad around Santa Monica yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, Westwood Village. And they are disrupting sidewalk traffic like crazy. Mm. But they have huge lobbying power. Mm. So it's not just unintended consequences. It's more like we're going to get rich despite the consequences. We don't care what happens down the road. Yeah, no. So what do you say about that? I mean, this is a big problem, right? Yeah, but I, I think the problem is a sort of a, as you say, it's a structural one because we don't let government be ambitious enough to have the conversation with them. So there's almost this implicit idea that those guys do the innovation yeah. and our job is just to regulate if we're lucky. Yeah. And then they can easily say, well, you regulators can't keep up with this. So, you know, you're, you're not any, being innovative and you're stifling the economy, which is not a happy picture. So the work that we do very much is actually often, we, we understand those companies, but we make sure that the city, the municipal government, for instance, the regulatory side is equally equipped and to develop a vision for the city and equally equipped to say, this is the way that Californians could get around. And then when somebody pitches an idea, then you can test it against that framework. You can begin to say, well, actually, you're, that's not going to work because we've looked into it. This was the problem with Uber in London. It was, uh, um, there was nothing to stop, say, Transport for London doing Uber for London, if you know what I mean. As in, to make taxis work in that way is Uber is a very good app from an individual point of view. A little bit of science on the data side, but frankly, not that much. And then, as you point out, a ton of lobbying. Now, if you are the, the operator and the regulator, like Transport for London are, you don't need lobbying because you are the, you're in charge. You can lobby yourself. Uh, and then the rest of it is, well, can you make a good app? Sure. Like six months in a room with probably 10 people in this room, we can make a good app, maybe. Certainly, it's not rocket science. But there's no, there was no R&D function 
in Transport for London. There was no innovation team there. There was no one looking ahead saying, what if we took that bit and that bit and put it together with this bit to make a thing? And this is what Mariana and Reiner's work, I think, is all about. We have to shift the narrative from just saying that innovation is just done by the Ubers and Lyfts of this world and say that innovation can be done all around and, in fact, has been done many times in the public sector in the past and currently as well. So but then at least... An ideological shift, right? Yeah, completely. This is why I describe the talk as the, the battle, because... <laughs> uh, it is, I think, genuinely a battle. So uh, when we're doing that work in Stockholm or Amsterdam and Sheffield, you know, all of those clients are the city governments, and we're basically getting them up to speed with all of this technology, the dynamics of them, understanding what they sh maybe should do and what they shouldn't do, things like that. Then at least they can have a, an equal debate. You know, they're not outgunned immediately in terms of innovation. Mm -hmm. And if the city is, knows what it's doing, it has a lot of cards. You know, imagine if you're a regulator and, a, and you have an operation and you're doing innovation. That's a really powerful, you know, that's, that's fantastic. So I think, I mean, it's, I think you're bang on. The, and I, th I believe the scooters just got lifted out of San Francisco in the last week or so, right? I think there was a... There was an attempt to, get, an them attempt to get them out. There was an attempt to get them out of Santa Monica. Yeah. But there was a huge lobbying and a big call, I of think, course, from the social yeah. network to go into the council meeting and flood it with, we have to have these scooters. Yeah. And these are hormone-driven young men yeah. zipping in competitive ways yeah, in yeah, pedestrian yeah. traffic. It's deadly. So the Santa Monica City Council, which had opposed it, initially reversed themselves said, you're welcome, come on in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so San Francisco, I don't know. I believe in the last week they've just decided to take them out. Just like the, you know, the, a few of the Chinese bike sharing schemes have had to be removed because of the, the amount of just the amount of waste involved in the system. That's why I picked the Oslo one as an example, because there you have it's a private company to be clear, but it, it's they, I know the, I know them really well, and they say they, the city should be running this. This is public transport, so we, we can be the operator. Just as Transport for London now, if you get the tube or the bus, there's a private company driving the thing. But it's branded as Transport for London, London, your relationship with Transport for London, you pay your money to Transport for London, the value stays in London, you know, or they decide where it goes actually at that point. The strategy is done here for the city, for the citizens. That's, a, that's kind of how it should be. And there's tons of room for private enterprise within that system still. Uh, it's just that it's got way out of kilter, particularly in California, but that has then impacted on the way that the European Union thinks about this stuff as well. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes. Gentleman right here. Uh, you talked about new technologies and how they add a new layer to the city. Mm. I want to know what's your idea about social media data and how, they can, how it can help designers through their process for designing, taking decision, and the like. Yeah. Um, so in a, in, a, in a brief plug for the what Ryder was talking about earlier, I just wrote a big piece online, which I didn't talk about here. Uh, work we've done in Eindhoven in the last two years, a project called Cloud Atlas, which is the idea of building a kind of mixing chamber of data that the city and designers can use to understand almost anything that's going on, and, and trying to be very kind of um, open about where that data comes from. Understand the provenance of it and understand the problems with it, but equally just don't rely on the traditional census data. Equal, so you would get into any geolocated social media data you can. You would look at Uber data if you could get your hands on it, and that might be a quid pro quo agreement with, the, with Uber and the city. You can operate here if we have full access to the, your data. Totally reasonable thing to ask for, unless you're Uber. Um, but nonetheless, those are, the broker, those are the deals being brokered now, peer by a tool sharing network. Fantastically interesting. Imagine the story of a hammer as it moves across 17 different families and what it might tell you about the way that people are living their life now. So we wanted to understand how to use that really messy, volatile, organic cloud of social media data and in concert with the very rigorous census data, which is collected every two years in a very Dutch way, you know, good way. Um, and begin to mix those two together. Understand that this, this stuff is very kind of variable, but equally this stuff is not that much more accurate in its own way. 
you know, that census data can be very crude as well. So absolutely it becomes then this very powerful tool for understanding more like the actual patterns of daily life. And then as a designer, that's your starting point, ideally. Just as it showed you with the cooperative project, if we understand how people live together and how they might want to live together and look at the patterns of living now, we'd be designing different houses. It's a bit odd that we're sort of designing houses or people live in houses from 1800 and 1900. We do not live like that anymore, any more than we dress like we did in 1900 or drive a Model T Ford. But somehow the idea of architecture is still locked in there because designers don't look at that data or have conversations. So. Thanks. Josh. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Dan. Really enjoyed that, um, as usual. Thanks again. Um, I just wondered, uh, a couple of the things you, you said on the transport front yeah. um, made me think about some of my experiences uh, traveling in developing countries or emerging markets. Yeah. Um, the, the, one of the things you said was um, that in the future, in, in cities, there might be um, more, more buses or, or sort of minivans taking people around, maybe they're self-driving. Mm. Um, and then you also said that, you know, you made that comment about do we really need pavements anymore? Mm. Uh, and, and that nice uh, diagram showing the sort of flow of people. Yeah. And actually that's my experience in, you know, Bangkok and, and some other sort of large cities um, in, in, in developing countries. And I, so I just wondered if you ever take, look to those for inspiration or, mm. um, and also maybe what does that tell us about um, overdevelopment in transport potentially might be? Yeah. Whether there's something there? No, I mean, um, <laughs> Bangkok without the accidents <laughs> would be interesting. And that's maybe, you know, that would be a great design driver, wouldn't it? So I, I, I'd want to take something like, um, there's a program called Vision Zero, which a bunch of US cities just signed up to actually, that Stockholm has been a huge leader of it, which is zero deaths and serious injuries due to traffic accidents um, in a city. And Stockholm thinks it can get there. In the US, about 107 people die every day because of traffic accidents. So I think it's a bunch of US cities are beginning to think this, this has to stop. So you, you could start with those kinds of outcomes as well as uh, security and comfort, user experience, things like that. This isn't the way that transport conversations happen. you know. But that's the, I'd want to sort of start with those things. And then we can look at the means by which we might get there. Um, and then I suspect that we'll find some, within that means bit, there's an interplay between what I call these kind of grid systems, like the tube or a bus, which is on a route going up and down like that on a timetable, and then these non-grid systems, which are then currently we use private cars for and bikes and stuff like that, ad hoc, on demand, flexible in the gaps. As you say, you know, in places like Nairobi, uh, that is what a lot of the minibuses are doing. They're sort of almost using You'd say they're really distributed, decentralized. They're sort of vaguely using predictive analytics, not in a googly kind of way, although Google tried to do something with them, the Matatus in Nairobi, which is kind of fascinating. Um, they really sort of move like Uber as a system, except there are many accidents. <laughs> um, so, so I'm interested in, could you have this kind of shared system of on-demand ad hoc stuff without the accidents? And then, you know, basically humans are really bad at driving. <laughs> Uh, we're just not good at it. Like, why would we be good at it? It's hard. Um, and humans are variable around the kind of things you wouldn't want to be variable about. So, so you know, none of us who know the autonomous mobility world enough would are going to say it's all sorted and it's here and ready now and we could go big time on it. You know, it's a really complex beast. But humans are so bad at driving and computers actually are already purportedly better. And that's sort of tested over now th millions of kilometers of road miles driven. So the, really the interesting question is like, how do we get there? How do you transform a Bangkok, keep that fluidity and that sense of flow? Mm. Um, but probably means taking humans out of the loop in the driving part. <laughs> then there's like, that's a really complex economic question mm. as well, obviously, right. because uh, well in the US again, I mean, I think truck driver is the second most frequent population. It's, sorry, occupation. It's kind of, you know, it's sort of, right. I don't know what the first is actually, but it's, anyway, it's kind of up there in terms of occupations. So then you, if you say, well, all of that stuff, who's slide out of the way, becomes unemployed. It's not like they're all going to be retrained as software engineers, for sure. So that's a huge problem. And then how do we approach that? So though, then we're in a public value conversation. Does it make sense to have a bus and then you still have a person on it? 
I would argue maybe yes. When I talk about robots, which is what a self-driving bus is, um, I'm usually wanting to have like a shepherd sheepdog relationship between a robot and a human. So you might still have a bus conductor in my idealized, very utopian city. Where, because the bus conductor is doing many, many things. If you think, if you're old enough to remember bus conductors, then you could have a conversation with them. And they would probably, sometimes, anyway, not in London that much, but <laughs> theoretically, they would be doing um, informal tourist stuff. You know, you know, you want to get off there for the Tower of London, not there. Right. They would be giving you kind of tidbits of social information. You know, they sort of, they're, they were doing all of that stuff, not as their job, but it's part of the value. And if you freed them up from driving, then right. what do we mean? What, like, what happens there? And I think as we increasingly have robotics around us, I'd really like to explore again from a design point of view, when do we need a human to be in the loop there? And what are they doing? They might not be doing the driving, but maybe they're doing all the social interactions that tram conductors and bus conductors used to do. That might be really valuable. We just need a, it goes back to Reiner's opening point. What's the value of a bus conductor? <laughs> Um, that isn't a conversation we've had in Britain for 40 years. <laughs> I see that we're out of time. So, oh, there is one. I can hang around. I can yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, go on. Just really quickly, I've just started working in a local authority through public practice, and last night I right. was doing some oh. training for councillors yeah. in terms of design. It's an authority that's never had a design person before, yeah. and I kind of realize that the people who are actually making the decisions ultimately are, are not aware of many things that I right. know, let alone what you're talking about. Um, yeah. Yeah. So how do you kind of make more public or educate on a kind of grander scale about what opportunities there are and some of the things you've said? Uh, yeah, public practice times a million would be <laughs> a good thing because one more thing I was going to talk about if I had time, which I don't, um, was around housing and the way that we used to have design intelligence in local authorities and enabled a vast amount of building like Park Hill or so on. And, and in places like Vienna, we still do, where this is social housing, right? You know, it's kind of extraordinary quality. Um, and the issue was we stopped making that around here, 1979, roughly, for some random reason. And then, so all that local authority building, Josh knows this graph really well, um, just sort of stopped. And with it went all of the design intelligence. If we look at the numbers, which I know you probably know, you know, like the London County Council Architects Department had 1,500 people in it at one point. It's kind of extraordinary. And in 1975, still 50% of all the architects in the country are in the public sector. Now it's 0.7. And in London, 0.1. So <coughs> we've just deleted that entire capability en masse. And we have, to, I'd argue, we have to put it back in. On mass. I'm sure. sure. <laughs> that the councillors are the ones, say, determining what the policy for the borough should be at, base, like, at the top level. They are the ones getting the say, but they're really, I mean, they're, they're not educated in most of the things they're determining the policy for. So the sort of lone people trying to yeah. explain what they could be aiming for. But kind of, how could we make that system a bit? Better. Yeah, well, uh, How do you that, that's a big that's a big <laughs> conversation. But I think it's also related to this question here. Sort of, it's also why a scooter company can lay waste to the streets of Santa Monica because there's nobody internally in the government saying, "Hang on a minute, that doesn't match our vision for the city that we've co-developed and designed very carefully as an innovative job." You know, so we absolutely the work I've done in Finland and other places was a bit like public practice, and Finland and I talked about that a lot. Training designers, deploying them into local government. Uh, it's happening all over Europe. Uh, public practice here is a ray of hope, I'd say, in a country that hasn't, again, like the bus conductor, hasn't had this conversation for 40 years. We absolutely need to put it back on the agenda because it's just, it's really dangerous to have taken it out. I know, I know, but a ray of hope, like I say. <laughs> of course, it's not only about architects, of course, it's also about economists and public policy, yeah. all the sets of education that they actually have Absolutely. given up on, on the idea of public value. And of course, this is why we are here and trying to bring it back. Yeah, let's end on a positive note. Yes, exactly. <laughs> ray of hope. Yeah, ray all, of hope. all power to you. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, thanks so much, Tan, for a very fascinating conversation. And thanks for you being here. And we have still two more lectures in this series left. One next week and the other one week after that. So check out our flyers 
Uh, I think they might be sold out, but if you talk to Velvet or Matthew, you can still get in. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you.